Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, Claims for Survivors of Sexual Abuse and Changes to the National Redress Scheme and Common Law Claims. My name's Carly Hansen, and I'm one of the Sector Sustainability Coordinators here at Community Legal Centres Queensland. Before we do get started with today's webinar, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding today's session. In Brisbane, they are the Turrbal and the Yagara peoples. I wish to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in our society. As today's webinar is being viewed by people throughout Queensland and Australia, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land throughout the country and extend a very warm welcome to any First Nations people joining in today. So I'm really pleased to welcome uh, today Michelle James, the Principal Lawyer uh, Queensland Law Society Personal Injuries Accredited Specialist and National Head of Abuse Law at Morris Blackburn to present uh, this session. I'll let Michelle tell us a little bit more about herself when I hand over to her in just a moment. Um, but firstly, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, so today's webinar is being recorded and we'll have the recording available to download later today or tomorrow. The PowerPoints have been emailed out to everyone this morning uh, and are also available to download from our website and from the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, Michelle's also uploaded uh, a newer version today, so make sure you get the newest version of those PowerPoints. Um, as we usually do, we'll hold, over, hold questions over to the end of the session and you can ask those questions in two ways. You can press the button that looks like a hand and we'll see that hand come up at our end and we can unmute you so you can ask your question via the microphone or you can just type your question into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll read your question out for Michelle. Um, so, uh, Michelle's going to be speaking uh, to us um, today, as I mentioned, on the changes, uh, the recent amendments and changes to the redress scheme. Um, in particular, she'll discuss uh, or provide an overview of the redress scheme, including the recent changes and participating institutions, who's eligible to access redress and the application process, common law claims, an overview of the assessment framework, uh, a bit of a comparison between redress and common law claims and finally some suggested changes to ensure the scheme uh, does stay true to the Royal Commission's recommendations. So without further ado I'll hand over to Michelle now to get us started. Thank you Michelle. Thanks Carleen, good afternoon everyone, thank you for having me along. Uh, can I too pay my deep respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we virtually meet today. For me it's the Yagra and Turrbal people. Can I also apologise to everybody who originally tried to dial into this webinar some weeks ago. We had uh, insurmountable technical issues on that occasion, so I'm very pleased that we're all meeting um, today in a way where we can uh, hear each other or you can at least hear me and you can see my PowerPoint. As Carly said, I'm very happy to take questions throughout, but um, I understand that we'll do them at the end, so we'll try and leave enough time to make sure that 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 happens and that I can deal with any of your questions um, at the end. If we don't get through them for whatever reason, I'm very happy to answer them or respond to them separately as well. Just a little bit about me, as Carly said, I'm the head of the abuse law practice here at Morris Blackburn. We operate um, uh, abuse claims in every um, state and territory in Australia. And we've got a, a large team of lawyers working nationally around the country on these claims. It's a very specialised area of law, as I'm sure that you can appreciate, and you may um, even have brought some of these redress type claims yourself. And we um, do take special efforts to ensure that everybody who practices in this area at my firm is specially trained in the area, not just in the area of law, but also specifically in trauma-informed care and practice to make sure that the people dealing with these claims um, do so in a way that doesn't cause any additional harm to our clients, but also protects the psychological well-being of our staff. For myself, I've practiced in this area since uh, about 2015 and um, very much enjoy working in this area of law. So we might kick off the, the webinar now and start just by looking at um, a bit of a timeline of um, uh, how we ended up with a redress scheme in the first place. So this is just an animated slide, so bear with me while I click through it quite quickly. Um, so in 
So first of all, back in 2012 is when we it was first announced that there would even be a Royal Commission. And that was the Gillard government that announced that on the 12th of November. And they moved quite quickly to publish terms of reference early the following year on the 11th of January. The Royal Commission then started to meet and to report and um, to, to uh, hold the various sort of public and private sessions. And their final report was um, intended to be released at the end of 2016. But halfway through, um, around 2015, the Royal Commission decided to release an interim report. And that was a report that really is the focus for a lot of what we're talking about today. And that was released on the 14th of September. It was the um, Redress and Civil Litigation Report. And I'll talk to you about that in a bit more detail as we move through the slides. But of course, that report recommended that there be a redress scheme set up. And we waited then some time. We'd had a change of government in between. And we waited until the 4th of November in 2016 before the Turnbull government announced that it would set up a federal redress scheme. We then had to wait um, for the uh, legislation to be set up. And that was set up uh, or released on the 26th of October 2017. And the final Royal Commission report was released a bit later on that year on the 15th of December. Mm -hmm. So you can already start to see that, you know, things are moving really quite slowly in terms of setting up a redress scheme. In 2018, there were the various Senate committee hearings into the redress legislation as part of the normal parliamentary process. And finally, on the 18th of June, the legislation was passed in the Senate, enabling the redress scheme to start on the 1st of July. And I can tell you from being around during that time, it really looked like we wouldn't get there, but we did. We got there for a, a 1 July start to the scheme. So the scheme commenced then on the 1st of July in 2018. And in 2019, there were almost 4,000 applications received. However, fewer than 200 payments were received. And at that time, the wait time for a redress decision to be made was between three and 12 months. So even at the outset, there were some challenges with the redress scheme. Moving into 2020, there were 7,000 applications received, but fewer than 3,000 decisions were made. So again, the timeframes really just started to continue to blow out during that period. There was an initial deadline of for institutions to join the scheme on the 30th of June 2020, um, which represented the second anniversary of this scheme. But in fact, that deadline was um, later extended. And so in 2021, there was that seven year extension given to join the scheme. And some amendments were introduced on the 15th of February 2021 to seek to sort of um, amend different parts of the Act. And that we then, of course, uh, are rapidly approaching the third anniversary of the scheme, which will be a little bit later and this year on the 1st of July. Just a little bit about the Royal Commission. Some of this you may already know, but um, just as a bit of a headline, I think it really helps to sort of hit home to us just the, the importance of the work that was done by the Royal Commission and just the scale of the work that was done by them. So as part of that, there were 60,000 survivors identified, and these are people who would have an eligibility for redress. Um, so 60,000 survivors identified. Now we can't be certain, of course, whether that is the real number or the right number of survivors, but there was a lot of money spent on actuarial and statistical modeling, and that's the best kind of number that we have of people who, would, who were identified by the Royal Commission as being eligible for redress. The Royal Commission then held over 8,000 private sessions, which is where a survivor got the opportunity to go along. Um, it wasn't exactly one on one. There was sometimes more than one commissioner there, but um, they got along to go along and tell their story in a private session. There were 4,000 institutions reported on and over 2,500 referrals to police and authorities. Uh, 204 prosecutions commenced, 57 public hearings and 50 research papers published. So a huge body of very important work that went on over many years. At the bottom there, just next to the speech bubble, you can see that of the survivors who attended the private session, so that's the 8,000 uh, or so people who attended in a private session, this is where they said that their abuse was sustained. So 62% of the abuse was in faith-based institutions. Um, so run by the different churches or other organisations um, in a faith-based institution. 
27% was at a government run institution. And then of those faith based institutions, 40% um, Catholic institutions, 8% in Anglican, and 4% in Salvation Army institutions. Okay, so just thinking then about this report that I mentioned earlier, and I do realize that this now is quite some time ago, 2015, but it's still the, the report that tells us everything we need to know about what the Royal Commission recommended about redress and civil litigation. So it is important just as kind of a source document and to anchor all of our later understanding to understand what this report said. So as I put there, it was um, released on the 14th of September, 2015, and it recommended three elements of redress when we talk about redress we tend to think of it as meaning a sum of money but in actual fact redress has three distinct elements and money is only part of it so the first element of redress is what we call a direct personal response the second is counseling and psychological care and the third is monetary payments so dealing with each of those in turn a direct personal response is a response from an institution to a survivor if they desire to have that response made to them. And most commonly, this is an apology. For some survivors, it's very important that they hear from uh, an appropriately qualified or senior person within the institution that um, abused them, that they their abuse is acknowledged and that they are apologized to. But direct personal responses can also take other forms. For example, and there are lots of instances of people who have as part of um, an application for redress or for common law who've had steps taken for example to rename buildings that were named after abusers so commonly for example um, a particular principal a long-standing principal at a school um, who may also have been an abuser commonly they can have buildings named after them or there can be statues of um, abusers or portraits hung in schools and other institutions and there are there are many many examples of people who as part of this process and as part of their direct personal response have sought to have those um, buildings or statues or portraits and so on either removed or renamed so it can a direct personal response can encompass any and, and all of those elements counseling and psychological care is um, fairly self-explanatory the royal commission recommended that counseling and psychological care be made available um, and they also recommended the monetary payments. Now, what the, uh, what the um, redress scheme recommended was that the monetary payment have a maximum payment of $200,000 and that there be a carefully considered matrix of assessment that would take into account things like the severity of the abuse, the severity of the impact and some other factors. So these three elements are what were, was recommended by this report that was re uh, released on the 14th of September, 2015. And as you'll see, this is not quite the redress scheme that we got. This is just what was recommended. So as I said in the outline timeline, the scheme commenced on the 1st of July, 2018. And what the scheme says is that redress consists of the following things. So firstly, a payment of up to $150,000. So you can already see that that is 50,000 um, short of what was recommended by the Royal Commission in their report. It also includes counselling and psychological assistance and an apology or a response from the entity responsible for the abuse. So the scheme that we got did adopt in large part those three separate elements. However, they were very different in terms of, um, in terms of the quantum or, or amount of those. Important to understand for anybody who may have to give advice to a person who comes to talk to them about wanting to seek access to redress is that if a person does access redress, it means that they will forever sign away their rights to bring a common law claim. And of course, that's perfectly fine. In fact, it's what the Royal Commission recommended. It's all about personal choice, but it is important for those of us who have to advise in this area to understand that if we advise somebody to go down a redress path, and they accept a redress payment that we've properly advised them about what it means in terms of a common law claim, obviously, and um, to make sure that they're correctly advised, but also to make sure that we are protected um, from any kind of negligence sort of claims ourselves. 
In terms of participating institutions, you have to be a participant, sorry, the institution in which you were abused needs to be a participating institution if you are to be eligible for abuse. There was quite a lot of publicity recently that you may have seen that the Jehovah's Witnesses have finally entered into the, um, the redress scheme. Um, that's quite a not notable um, example that received press recently because the Jehovah's Witnesses had until that time refused to enter the redress scheme. And that meant that even though um, the people who were abused in a Jehovah's Witness institution may have met all of the other eligibility criteria, because this, the institution itself being the Jehovah's Witness um, church or organisation was not part of redress, those people were simply not eligible. So that, that is a qualifying um, uh, participating participatory sort of clause that the institution needs to be a participating institution. So all Commonwealth state and territory institutions are participating institutions and non-government institutions must be declared to be a participating institution. Um, this slide says that they have until the 1st of July 2020 to join the scheme but as I mentioned earlier that's very recently been extended and there's now a further seven years for institutions to join the scheme. And there's many, many current and historical entities that are now participating institutions. There are still some who are not participating institutions, but the first step, if you're advising anybody on redress, is to look up on the redress website to see whether the institution that they sustain their abuse in um, are in fact a participating institution. And most large institutions are now participating entities. Okay, so moving then to who can access redress. So the first thing is that the sexual abuse must have occurred before the person, uh, sorry, before the 1st of July 2018. So any sexual abuse after that is, it doesn't make you qualify for redress. Now, to be clear, if the, um, if the abuse was kind of before that date and after, then yes, potentially you are, you are uh, in the redress scheme. But additionally, you must be over 18 or turn 18 before the end date of the scheme. So the end date of the scheme at the moment is the 30th of June 2028 and that's 10 years from the date that the scheme first came into existence. Interestingly this is one of the ways in which the scheme that we have differs from what was recommended by the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission recommended that the scheme exist kind of into perpetuity or at least until a reasonable time frame um, has elapsed so as to allow all of those 60,000 people that they modelled would be eligible to have had an opportunity to access redress. But the scheme that we got, in fact, only runs for 10 years, although it can, of course, be extended. Applicants must also be an Australian citizen or permanent resident. This is another way that the scheme has been, um, is different to what was recommended by the Royal Commission and a way in which it's been criticised by advocates for the scheme. Um, nothing in the Royal Commission's initial um, report or recommendations talked about applicants needing to be an Australian citizen or permanent resident. And there are lots of instances of people who um, are neither a citizen nor a permanent resident who in fact were abused in Australian institutions but who are no longer, who are not el eligible for redress. And those include, for example, child migrants who were sent over commonly from the UK in the 50s um, typically those people came to Western Australia um, and there was um, a lot of abuse occurred in the institutions into which those children were placed. If those children have returned home as adults to the UK or other countries and never obtained citizenship or permanent resident status, then they're not eligible for redress. A participating institution must be responsible for the abuse. So as we've already spoken about the institution, that's kind of your first step, making sure that the institution is a participating institution. And applicants must apply between these dates. So although I just said that the scheme will run for 10 years until the 1st of July, uh, sorry, the 30th of June, 2028, applications close a year before that on the 30th of June, 2027. And that date's obviously coming up quite quickly. Um, we're sort of only about six and a bit years away from that date already, so it's important, important to understand that. There are some people who cannot apply for redress, and this is a sort of a quick list of people who cannot apply for a redress claim. So firstly, if they've already made an application, 
this is a really important one to understand because um, it's not like submitting a different type of a claim, um, you know, an administrative type claim where you can sort of make applications and withdraw them at different times. It doesn't work like that with redress. You can only make one application, so it needs to be a good one and it needs to be an application that the survivor is ready to make and that they can make kind of full disclosure because it's once the application's been made and a decision's been made, they can't then seek to sort of introduce further information down the track. You can't apply for security notice is in place and this is um, legislation that was introduced to um, colloquially, it was um, to, for people who have suspicions of being involved in terrorist activities where a security notice is issued against them, those people are not eligible to apply and that's a public policy type argument. Um, the applicant is a child who won't turn 18 before the 30th of June 2027 or if the person's in jail they're not eligible to apply either. Just a little bit about the application process. I'm not sure how many of you would be involved in submitting applications for redress and perhaps you're very familiar with this already and if you are my apologies. If you're not familiar with this or if the um, particular CLC that you're involved in doesn't submit redress applications, I'm sure you're aware of other organisations such as No More that submit uh, redress applications on people's behalf. But we'll just talk through the application process briefly. So firstly, you submit the application um, to the National Redress Scheme and the applicant has to satisfy the operator that there's a reasonable likelihood that they were sexually abused. So reasonable likelihood is the standard of the burden or the, the, the standard of proof. So it's obviously a lower threshold then than the standard in a common law claim, um, which, um, uh, which is balance of probabilities, as you would be aware. Once they've submitted the application, there is then an independent decision maker who will make a decision about the application. One of the reasons that there were so many delays in the early part of the redress scheme's existence and operation is because that there were not sufficient independent decision makers. There were only literally a couple at the start and for about the first 12 months or so of the scheme's existence. Um, but a lot of lobbying by No More and others involved in this, um, in this space managed to increase the number of independent decision makers, which has then sort of sped things up, although there are still quite a few delays. And then once the independent decision maker has made a decision about the application, assuming that they say that the, the reasonable likelihood standard has been met um, and that the application should be approved, then the operator must make an offer as soon as reasonably possible. As we've already touched upon, only one application can be submitted for the lifetime of the scheme. And so if a person is want, wanting to make a redress application, it's important that they're advised that they only get one bite at the, at the cherry. And so that really we need to make sure that the application that's submitted makes full disclosure of all matters that need to be considered and that the person's kind of emotionally prepared to go through the redress process because they can't kind of dip in and dip out. Just a little bit about the counselling and psychological care. So to remind you, there are three elements to redress. The first is the direct personal response. The second is the counselling and psychological care. And the third is the monetary payment. So speaking about the counselling and psychological care, this is an area where there were huge departures from the recommendations of the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission spent a lot of time looking at the need for psychological and counselling care for survivors, but not just for survivors, also for their families. And what the Royal Commission recommended was that um, the counselling and psychological care that should be funded by the redress scheme should be lifelong and episodic. And what was meant by that was a recognition that for survivors of childhood sexual abuse, the needs for counselling can really um, change at different times in their life. There can be periods where the need for psychological and counselling support is very intense and there can be other periods where the person um, is, is coping reasonably well. And so the Royal Commission recommended this and recommended therefore that the counselling and um, that the, the payments for counselling kind of flex to meet the person's needs as and when um, their needs may heighten. It also recommend recognised the intergenerational impacts of childhood trauma 
and recommended that counselling and other care be available for family members, for immediate family members, um, both for their own trauma, but also to support the person who had suffered the child sexual abuse. Sadly, that's not what was um, that's not what we got when the redress scheme was, re was recommended, and instead we got what's up there on the screen. So a payment of up to five thousand dollars for counselling outside of the monetary payment that's made for the scheme. And somewhat surprisingly, and in ignorance of all of the research that the Royal Commission did, but all of the known theory around. Um, uh, abuse and impact. The, the legislation that we got nonetheless linked the need for support to the nature of the abuse. And as you can see there, $5,000 payment for penetrative abuse, two and a half for contact abuse, and 1.25 thousand for exposure abuse. I'll talk you through what these three definitions mean um, just in a later slide. But very, very low amounts of money there. Anybody who's seen a psychologist privately will know that the sessions are usually cost in the order of around $100. And so um, that money of $5,000 for penetrative abuse and um, for the payment for psychological care really wouldn't last very long at all, certainly wouldn't last a lifetime. Let's just talk about the direct personal response, which we've already spoken about a little bit. And this is what the legislation says that the institution must take reasonable steps to provide a direct personal response if requested to do so. That's a very important sort of caveat there and that's because um, the Royal Commission rec recognised the importance of personal agency or personal choice around these things. And I certainly know from acting for survivors over um, quite a few years now, that some of my clients will absolutely want the direct personal response. They will absolutely want to be looked in the eye um, by the current archbishop or a current very senior person from the institution and be told that they, um, their story has been heard, that they've been acknowledged and that they are sorry for the abuse. But I've equally had many clients who've said that an apology wouldn't matter a bit, that they don't care about apologies, that apologies are hollow, that they mean nothing. And so it really, and you can't really sort of predict which way a person's going to go because, of course, it's such a personal thing to feel. And so it's really only if requested to do so. But a direct personal response can include any one of the following or one or more of these. So an apology or a statement of regret, an acknowledgement of impact, an assurance as to steps taken to prevent the abuse and or an opportunity to meet with a senior official of the institution. Um, a great story um, that I like to tell about how we facilitated a direct personal response as part of an abuse claim that we ran, and um, this was a common law claim, but we facilitate direct personal responses as part of common law claims as well. And we had a client whose abuse occurred in a <clears throat> Christian Brothers school, and this person wanted a direct personal response from um, the current um, Archbishop of, um, uh, of, of Brisbane. Um, even though it's trustees of the Christian Brothers School that in fact were responsible. And our client had a particular way that he wanted the apology to be given. First of all, he didn't want um, the person who gave the apology, want the Archbishop in their usual clerical um, garb. He wanted him in jeans and a t-shirt and he made a very specific request about that. And that's because you know, the outfit was very triggering for this survivor because that was the outfit that had been worn when the abuse occurred. He also didn't want to have to travel into Brisbane because he didn't like cities and he was from out west. And so he made the request that the Archbishop agree to meet him at a particular McDonald's um, in a particular, um, close to a particular country town out west somewhere. And all of these um, demands around how the apology and meeting take place were met without hesitation by the Archbishop who immediately agreed to all of those conditions because of the importance to this survivor. And interestingly, hearing that, the survivor decided that they no longer needed the apology to be made, that they, um, it was enough for them to know that the Archbishop was willing to meet all of their demands and provide the apology and the direct personal response in the way that they had insisted upon, and that really was enough for them. So interesting how that one played out. 
Okay, we're going to talk now just about how redress is just one um, choice. And as I said earlier, it's important to understand that if somebody accepts a redress offer that they will never again be able to bring or continue a common law claim. I say continue because um, sometimes we have people who've started a common law claim and who then go off and make a redress claim and they really then have to choose. It's kind of a once and for all decision. And so really um, my very strong advice to you if you take nothing else away from today's session is to understand that one point. If you have somebody who comes into one of your um, community legal centres with a redress offer or if they um, are seeking your assistance to make a redress offer, just make sure that they're giving this advice. It's usually free to see a law firm. Most law firms will give advice for free, and certainly my law firm does. And so the person's actually got nothing to lose apart from perhaps a little bit of time because the redress off offer will stay open um, for, for a period and to enable them to get some advice. All right, a little bit about the assessment framework then, which I said that I would talk you through and I said that I would explain some of these terminology to you. But I want you to understand how it is that a redress payment is calculated because the payment, of course, is the third element. We've dealt with the direct personal response, we've dealt with the counselling and psychological support, and now we're talking about the monetary payment, which is the thing that most people think about when they think about a redress payment. So this here is the assessment framework that can be found in the legislation. And the way that uh, an, an assessment of redress is made is to consider this framework. And so first of all, the very first thing that the decision maker will do is to look at column one and determine which of the rows, row one, two or three, does the abused person fall into. So the three types of uh, abuse are penetrative abuse, contact abuse and exposure abuse. I'm just going to talk you through what they mean and then we'll go back to that slide. So firstly, penetrative abuse, and that is if any abuse involved penetration and it was left quite ambiguous as to whether um, uh, fellatio would be penetrative abuse or not. Contact abuse is physical contact, including with an object, but where there is no penetration. And exposure abuse is none of the abuse involved physical contact. And exposure abuse is typically what we would refer to as grooming type of behavior. So it can include, for example, um, watching pornography with a child or an adult masturbating in front of a child, but not actually touching the child. So having determined which of the um, column, which of the rows the person fits into, whether it's penetrative abuse, contact abuse or exposure abuse, the decision maker would then move, or so the person making the offer would then move across each of columns two, three, four, five and six to um, look at the particular payments. So firstly, they would look at a recognition of the sexual abuse and you can see there that if your abuse was contact abuse, the maximum that you can get as a recognition of your sexual abuse is $30,000. Now, obviously, um, contact abuse, because it can involve physical contact, just not penetration, that can include, for, include, for example, masturbation. So very serious, um, very, very serious sexual abuse. But because it wasn't penetration, that therefore limits the amount that you can get for recognition of the sexual abuse. So um, to my mind and to others who are active in this space, a um, very unfortunate way of categorising impact based on the nature of the abuse. Column three then recognises the impact of the sexual abuse. And again, you can see that depending on the nature of the abuse, it determines the amount that you receive from 20 down to five, depending on the nature of the abuse. Column four is recognition of related non-sexual abuse. So that could include, for example, children who were beaten physically as well as being abused sexually, or it can include um, emotional abuse. It can involve um, removal from kin um, and put people who are placed, for example, into orphanages away from um, siblings or other connection to community. And that's the same, um, $5,000 regardless of the nature of the abuse. Columns five and six are um, similar. So column five 
is um, if a person was institutionally vulnerable, what that means is that the person's living arrangements increased the risk of sexual abuse. So commonly that meant children who were in an, uh, a closed institution such as an orphanage or children who were in a boarding school or other, other arrangement whereby the mere fact that they lived there, that made it easier for the abuse to occur. So a person would, would not be considered institutionally vulnerable if, for example, they attended a day school um, but went home to mum and dad at the end of the day. That would not be institutionally vulnerable. Column six, the recognition of the extreme circumstances of sexual abuse. So you can see that that sum of money of $50,000 is only available to people who suffered penetrative abuse. And extreme circumstances was pen is defined as penetration taking into account institutional vulnerability and related non-sexual abuse. So in other words, if you are in row one there and you kind of go along the rows, if you're um, getting payments in each of columns two, three, four and five, almost certainly you will be entitled to the additional 50,000 payment um, if, in recognition of the extreme circumstances of sexual abuse. But again, that really fails to recognise that contact abuse and even exposure abuse obviously can be extremely traumatic for children. I'm going to work through some examples here and these are or can be triggering as can many other parts of the presentation, but I'll just talk you through these really just to illustrate the unfairness that's inherent in the assessment matrix. So firstly, um, if we think about a child who's abused in a closed institution, let's say the abuse happened over five years by a priest on around 20 occasions in total. So 20 occasions over five years. The abuse includes penetration. There was some physical abuse. That person is entitled to a maximum payment of $150,000. I should have said too, the related physical abuse, often sexual abuse, um, was committed under the guise of physical abuse. So um, there would be, um, you know, back in the days, of course, when physical abuse of children in schools and other institutions was um, acceptable um, or at least tolerated, um, that there would often be an attempt to um, discipline a child physically. And then it was in that context where the child was removed from a classroom that the sexual abuse could take place. So that's the first one, a um, child abused um, over five years but on 20 occasions and contrast that with this next example. This is a child again in a closed institution. This time is where the abuse is over five years, but four times each week. So the first example was around four times a year. This is four times a week. So much more frequent abuse over a much, much therefore kind of longer sustained period. The abuse is oral sex and masturbation. There was no penetration and no related physical abuse. This person's maximum payment under redress is $45,000. So immediately you can see by contrasting example one and example two, um, that there is, some, there is quite a lot of unfairness in the assessment matrix. A few more examples to just work through with you. First then, um, child abuse on six occasions by a state school teacher. However, on each occasion there was penetration with associated physical abuse. The maximum payment there is $95,000 and that's because it wasn't a closed institution. A child at a state school gets to go home at the end of the day to mum and dad or another sort of family arrangement. And so because it's not a closed institution and therefore there can't be those extreme circumstances, the maximum payment is $95,000. If there were no physical abuse in this example, the maximum payment would be $90,000. Example here, except that it was not penetration, so contact abuse only, you can see that the payments drop down to 45 and to 40 if there's no physical abuse. Final worked example is actually a real life example of one of my clients, um, altered in a way to sort of protect an um, identity, but let's say this is a child abuse by a gymnastics coach. So let's assume that this was a participating institution, but a non-closed institution, so not a boarding school, but um, you know, a gymnastics coach just in a kind of local suburb-based um, gymnastics club. No penetration or contact, but grooming behaviour. So giving alcohol, showing pornography or masturbation in front of the child. 
the maximum payment under redress is $10,000 for that sort of um, abuse. And if there had been associated physical abuse, there would be a maximum payment of $15,000. So huge discrepancies, and I can tell you from acting for many people in this field for a lot of years, and I should be clear, I don't bring redress claims, and my firm doesn't do that because there are institutions that will do that work for free. Um, and I feel very strongly that clients shouldn't have to um, pay for services that are available very competently for free. But from acting for many years for clients in common law claims, um, this, this example, for example, that's on the screen at the moment, this client of mine was very, very seriously impacted by the nature of the abuse that she suffered. Um, in part, it was because this um, person engaged in the conduct, although he hadn't moved on to actual um, contact or penetrative abuse with her yet, he certainly was on the path and in fact, had, she later found out had progressed to that stage with a friend of hers. And so she felt that she sort of had a bit of survivor's guilt and was very hideously impacted. The only way that get to bring a claim that sort of adequately compensates you for the impact and not just um, basing it on the nature of the abuse is to bring in fact a common law claim. But there are some differences between common law claims and redress claims. Um, and just a quick sort of um, note there about the, the, the differences. The main difference is that for a redress claim, you don't need a lawyer to bring that claim for you. That said, um, as everybody on the call would understand, um, somebody who's got some kind of legal training or other sort of training who could help a person adequately order their thoughts and their story and their time and their evidence will obviously assist with achieving a greater outcome. But strictly speaking, there is no need um, for a lawyer. Um, but for a common law claim, typically you would need a lawyer to be able to pull together all of the evidence. In terms of the timeframes involved um, for a redress claim, um, it says it's not clear and it's likely to be less than a year. That's because the timeframes have at different times fluctuated. At the moment, I understand that they are processing redress claims in around about 12 months. But at different times that's increased um, to sort of 15 months and it has also decreased at different times but it's usually around about the 12 month mark for a common law claim as you would expect it's slightly longer so usually it takes about 18 months for a common law claim to be settled and that's if litigation is not going to be involved if litigation is involved so if we have to start a claim in court then obviously that time frame does um, extend out considerably in terms of the likely amount of the payment, um, that's limited under redress to $150,000. And average payments at the time the scheme was set up were expected to be about $76,000. Under common law, it's impossible to say what the amount is because it's so dependent on the person and their particular circumstances. And in particular, the impact of the abuse on their capacity to earn a living in the way that they might have um, being expected to do had the abuse not occurred. So it's very kind of um, tailored, it's a very tailored solution to the individual rather than sort of putting a person in, into an assessment framework and calculating um, the payment and other uh, money that they receive based on the nature of the abuse. So the cost um, of bringing a claim um, free under redress, if you do it yourself or if you bring it through an, um, an organisation such as No More or Relationships Australia or perhaps some of the people on the call are used to bringing redress claims. So usually that will be free. Um, if you bring a common law claim, on the other hand, um, there's usually some legal cost to pay. Most of the legal costs are paid by the institution, but there's usually a gap fee um, that's paid by the, um, paid by the survivor. Cancelling is included in redress if the need is established and it's also included in common law claims if the need is established. And again, the direct personal response, both are included, are included in both redress and common law if requested by the individual. And as the story that I told earlier about uh, the McDonald's apology um, illustrates, um, it's something that we regularly assist our clients with. In fact, it's something that we always ask them in the first appointment with us. Would you like a direct personal response? And we're able to talk to them about what that could look like. I wanted to share with you some personal stories of um, people who my team have assisted to bring common law claims. And the first is Albert, and Albert got an amazing story. Albert, um, 
Albert Aitken, uh, and we're able to name him there, he's personally um, kind of named himself um, and allowed his name to be used. And in fact, he told us that that was a very important part of his healing, was that he um, refused to be sort of, um, to hide his abuse any longer. Um, Albert came to my firm, not because of his historical abuse claim, but because he had mesothelioma. And um, my firm, uh, in addition to the abuse law practice, also has a practice which specialises in dust diseases. And so Albert came to that team who helped him to bring a claim um, for his negligently caused mesothelioma. So he was exposed to asbestos um, in negligent circumstances. And as part of that claim, um, he had to um, obviously give his lawyer instructions about other different parts of his life and a very diligent lawyer at my firm who, as a trainee lawyer and a grad lawyer had done some work with me, um, Albert disclosed to him that as a child he'd suffered um, uh, child sexual abuse. And so this very smart grad lawyer understood enough to know that potentially Albert had some other rights and asked for his permission to pass on his details to our um, a, a con a institutional abuse team. Albert gave that permission and we gave the um, details to our lawyer in Western Australia. Albert was living in Bribie Island, but um, the abuse had occurred in Western Australia in a home over there. Albert though had mesothelioma as I've indicated, and that meant that he was really already living on borrowed time. And he had a terminal prognosis and the doctors had given him three months to live. And so we gave this to our lawyer in WA and said, do what you need to and you've got less than three months to do it because Albert needs to see um, a result before um, before he passes away. And so my lawyer over there, I'm still not entirely sure how she did it, but she did it. She managed to get a claim ready in something like eight and a half weeks. She got it ready for a trial. It was set down for a trial on a Wednesday and the matter settled on Monday um, for a million dollars. And so Albert lived to see the million dollars paid out to him. And you can see the picture there of Albert in his home on Bribey Island with his dog. Um, and he told us that really disclosing the sexual abuse, um, he disclosed it to the mesothelioma lawyer. That was one of the first people he ever told about the abuse. He'd never told his family. But having disclosed it that once and having felt empowered to begin his journey towards acknowledgement of what happened to him in the form of monetary payment, he then felt empowered to tell everybody. He told his family. And as I said there, this newspaper story was a very big an important thing for Al, uh, Albert he really wanted to um, tell his story so fabulous outcome there and um, we, we've kept in touch with him and with his family now another personal story that I just wanted to talk to you about and um, this is a very difficult claim that we brought not least because the scouts in New South Wales which is why this claim was bought are a notoriously difficult institution to deal with and um, they have routinely told us that they don't have the money to pay for settlements and um, notwithstanding that we're aware they own considerable assets. This person was abused by a scout master and this scout master was a known paedophile. There have been a number of complaints made about him, but the scouts had um, either chosen or were derelict in their duties to sort of um, act properly upon these um, complaints but, or they've chosen to just sort of ignore them and sweep them under the carpet. Um, and our client was um, was abused and was hideously impacted by this. The trauma had really left him virtually unemployable. And in June 2020, we settled that claim for 1.65 million. And this, this individual had been living overseas um, for very many years since he was sort of in his early 20s because he literally could not bear to be in the same country as the person uh, who had abused him or, and, and even the scouts. And um, coronavirus has overtaken us, unfortunately, and so he hasn't been able to return home, but he now feels able to return home to Australia, which is very much where he wants to live, um, but where he had never felt able to before and until this abuse was acknowledged to him. I'm mindful of time, so I've really just got a couple of slides that I want to talk you through. Um, there has been a second anniversary review of the redress scheme, and that was um, undertaken by Robin Crook. Um, now, the review has taken place, but we've not yet seen the results of it. The review was due to be, or the report was due to be released at the end of February, but in fact, it's going to be tabled at um, COAG. So it will be tabled there, and then we will see um, that report. I did have a quick look this morning just to see if it had somehow been slipped in last week, but it hasn't. And so um, I'm very happy if anyone's interested, I can update you if that report comes out. 
Um, I spoke at the very start about some um, amendments made to the National Redress Scheme, um, which was a bill that was introduced in February. And this is really um, what was in the bill. It's very minor amendments, nothing kind of um, landmark or sort of groundbreaking. It's really uh, tinkering around the edges with just some sort of process type amendments. Uh, I won't talk you through those, but they're in the power points and um, basically just some minor amendments. Interestingly though, Labour, um, Labour put up um, quite a lot of amendments to that bill, um, which were not accepted and they failed by a couple of votes in the Senate, but um, they um, included naming and shaming non-participating institutions and this is something that my firm and many others in the space have been calling for for quite some time, um, which is that you know we should be publicly saying who it is, who are the big institutions who are not in redress. They also uh, amended or sought to amend the bill so that the cap on redress payments be increased from that 150,000 that we got to the 200,000 that was recommended, and also to end the indexing of previous payments. So if a client um, or survivor has ever received any payment in the past, either from the institution or from a different redress scheme. So here in Queensland, commonly um, people have had uh, payments from the Ford scheme back in the sort of the 90s. Those payments are indexed. So if they receive 7,000 from the Ford scheme in 1995, it gets indexed into, today, into today's money. And um, it's a very unfair way of meaning that because of the length of time that has, um, has run, many of these payments do sort of um, get eaten away. Uh, so they get that increase to levels, which means that any new payment kind of gets eaten away and Labour sought to have all of that removed um, uh, and a few other sort of um, amendments, but sadly they didn't, um, they didn't get up. I just want to alert you here to an emerging issue in the space for redress claims um, and apologies for the very distasteful name of survivor farming, but it's a, a distasteful name describing an even more distasteful practice that I just want to alert you all to so that you can be on the lookout for it. There is a growing practice that, that, which is emerging of um, people setting up businesses that purport to be support or advocacy type groups for survivors of sexual abuse. But the business model for these organisations is in fact to sell the survivor's story or claim to a law firm who pays a fee and then gets to act for that client. Um, in case anybody's wondering, I can give 100% assurance that Morris Blackburn never has and never will engage in these sorts of um, practices. And in fact, we have been a very vocal critic of these practices existing in the space. We've seen examples of uh, these organisations, these groups that set up, which are, receive a payment from a law firm um, for a survivor's details. Um, who the law firms then on charge that payment to the survivor, dressing it up as either a medical report or an investigation report fee or the like. It's an incredibly distasteful and abhorrent practice because of course, survivors can access redress through an organisation such as No More or Relationships Australia or even one of your centres, or they can speak to um, law firms who usually won't charge them anything at all for finding out what their rights are. Um, so this is a, a really appalling practice and um, as you can imagine um, as soon as you sort of monetize anything like this fraudulent claims have started to appear and what we're seeing is then a knock-on impact in terms of the willingness of respondents to settle claims for genuine survivors so they have started to adopt a, um, a viewpoint that everybody's everybody's a fraud everybody's fraudulent until we kind of find out otherwise and that's unfortunately seeking to um, then delay the claims for legitimate survivors. It's something that um, my firm is advocating um, around. We've met with the Queensland Attorney General Chief of Staff to talk about this issue um, and there's sort of a growing voice um, amongst uh, people who sort of uh, legitimately practice in this area to have this practice stamped out. Um, because it's so abhorrent. So that's just a quick kind of um, note about an emerging issue in the space. So Carly, that's the end of the presentation. We've only left five minutes for questions, but I don't have anywhere to go. And if anyone's got a, a question that they want to ask and they want, we can't get through them in five minutes, then I'm very happy to hang around. But over to you, if you want to read out the questions or moderate the questions. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Michelle. A great presentation um, and some thank you messages coming through uh, the chat as well. Um, so firstly, I might ask um, Suzanne's question. So she's asked, um, can a redress claim name two respondent institutions? For example, a minister from one religious group um, offered services in a facility run by another religious group and abuse occurred in the course of that service delivery. And if there are two respondents, can they cooperate or share information or share costs in a redress claim or common law claim? Yeah, great question, Suzanne, thank you. And um, yes, you can name two respondent institutions and they do share the costs. What's not clear though is how they share the costs. Um, you know, is it 50-50 or do they somehow look at um, you know, was there more abuse in one of the institutions and, and less abuse in a different institution? It's kind of not clear, but absolutely, you can name more than one respondent. In terms of the sharing of information, that's a bit more tricky because of privacy type concerns, but um, the redress scheme would facilitate that sort of sharing of information. So yeah, great question. Okay, thank you. Um, so Charles has asked um, if you could um, provide any information on the ranges for pain and suffering you're finding in Queensland historic sex abuse claims and that would be um, in common law claims, I imagine. Yeah, in common law claims, yes, thanks Charles. Um, we've actually got no, um, or very few sort of um, assessments by the courts in these areas and, and it is difficult because um, the um, there's just not a lot of common law available on these. There's not been a lot of um, ranges made by judges, but certainly we would commonly claim pain and suffering amounts um, well in excess of 100,000, up to sort of 200,000. We also claim exemplary damages in circumstances where we say that, you know, the abuse was just so abhorrent um, and particularly where the institution knew or ought to have known, um, then we would claim exemplary damages as well. Um, commonly though, when we come to settle the claims, um, all of the heads of damage all kind of get bound up into one and so we don't usually break it down into um, specific, uh, you know, heads of damage. So, you know, the respondent doesn't come and say we're offering you this much for pain and suffering and this much for all of your other heads of damage. Um, but certainly the amounts are, you know, the, the amounts typically that we would settle common law claims for in excess of the 150,000 maximum that you would get under redress, but that's not all pain and suffering money. And there is there is jurisprudence coming out of some of the other states and territories um, where the amounts payable for pain and suffering are um, far more generous than perhaps we would typically get in Queensland. What's interesting though, is that pain and suffering amounts are regulated um, by um, the Civil Liability Act um, for, um, uh, for injuries suffered after a particular date and because this because this abuse and the injuries are often historic that law doesn't apply and so we're not kind of bound by the very sort of parsimonious um, caps on general damages that you would see if somebody was bringing a claim for abuse that occurred you know in the last sort of 10 or 15 years and so we can we can claim greater amounts. Great thank you. Um, so a couple of questions that came through um, when people registered as well. So I'm not sure whether um, these people are, are here in the session today, but the first question is from Robin. Um, so Robin's interested in knowing how local community organisations might be able to support and assist victim survivors. That's a great question too. Look, I think the first thing is just to kind of be aware of the, the issues and, you know, attending a, a presentation like this that sort of links you in and uh, you know even at a fairly superficial level on all of the issues is a really important start. I think knowing that um, it's a very different way to deal with a person who suffered um, this sort of complex trauma as a child as well um, and being aware of that even if you may not understand the specific ways that you can deal with them that will avoid more trauma even just being aware that they need to be treated differently that would sort of perhaps lead you to even just go and read a, a google an article or something like that that might assist um i think knowing that the person's got options um two main options which would be in redress and common law and that you know th the choices really just need to be understood by the individual and there will be really good reasons in either direction why they may choose a particular um choose a particular option and it's not for you or for me or anyone else for that matter to, um, to, to have a view about that, but really they just need to understand um, going in what, what each of the different routes means for them um, because people have different motivations. 
And the most important thing, which is what I said earlier in the presentation, if you take nothing else away, is understanding that if a person accepts a redress claim, then they're forever precluded from bringing a common law claim. And so for us as lawyers or anyone who's got a practicing certificate, obviously there's, um, there's risks there if we give poor advice. And so making sure that you know who you can get advice from um, whether it's um, you know from an organisation like No More or Relationships Australia, or whether it's from a law firm that might be able to assist you, but making sure you know who to refer the person to. Thanks, Michelle. And and leading on from what you've said there about um, the the victim or survivor's um, right to bring a redress scheme, a uh, redress claim, um, if they try firstly with a common law claim are they and then they fail are they able to go back to the redress scheme or is that also um barred yeah no absolutely no they definitely can um and it's a different if it, it's a different standard of proof so for um a common law claim it's um uh Gosh, was a complete mental blank. Balance of probabilities. I was going to say beyond reasonable doubt. That's definitely not the same. Um, beyond, uh, sorry, the balance of probabilities, and it's a lower test for um, of uh, reasonable likelihood for redress claims. To be honest, though, um, I can't. It is pretty rare that we will fail in a common law claim, and I can't ever think of a situation where we failed at common law and yet redress just the matical of practicality would be available. So if we fail at common law, it's usually because we just can't prove at all that the person, for example, was in the institution in the first place, or because there are the kind of complex um, causation type problems. But so theoretically, absolutely. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's not that, you know, if we're sitting negotiating common law claims, we're, we're not kind of talking about um, balance of probabilities and, not quite met that test but they would meet the reasonable likelihood test but it, but it's absolutely a possibility yeah okay and that that leads well into lisa's question which um she's uh said that she's really interested in the threshold of evidence in the redress scheme so that lower standard of reasonable likelihood and what that actually means in practice and what sort of things the person would need to show to meet that lower standard yeah it, it's another that's another really great question um from lisa um so one of the interesting things about the, the redress scheme is that people involved in making the assessments of claims are not actually allowed to talk about how they make the assessment of claims. And in fact, it's a criminal offence. It's one of these weird sort of peculiarities arising out of the redress scheme. That said, I don't make the decisions and have never made a decision and therefore I'm sort of able to talk about what I know. Um, so I think really what they're looking for is evidence that the person was in the institution at the time when they say the abuse occurred um, uh, and you know you can get that typically from you know if, if it was a closed institution typically there will be a department of communities file or if it was a school you know it's kind of your parents might have paid fees or you know just you just have school reports or whatever to show that you were in the institution and um, and then you would also need to have an injury and usually you can show that most most of the people that we deal with um, you know have, have made complaints about um, the, the sexual abuse and the trauma that they've suffered over a number of years to doctors and, and to other people. Um, it's also one of the other things that the, um, the scheme and, and we are also in the common law phase look for is whether there was a known paedophile in the institution. So there are some kind of prolific um, paedophiles um, that become sort of very well known, um, particularly the ones that were moved around from diocese to diocese. Um, that we know about and so we kind of you know if we know that that paedophile was in that school at that particular time um, then it's it's fairly uh, you know you would say that the burden then has been met that the standard has been met because um, if a person saying they're abused by that person in that institution at that time and that person was a known paedophile then you know the person's word is going to be accepted um, but beyond that I don't know enough about any of the redress claims that have been rejected to understand what it is about a rejected application that a person could and should have said that would have perhaps satisfied the decision maker that the standard had been met. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, the final question that I've got here, and, and this one's just uh, sort of 
um, based on the scenario that you provided of Albert, where he only had that short time frame um, due to his other illnesses. Um, so what happens then if the survivor or victim passes away before the claim is finalised? Does it go to their yeah, estate? Go How does that work with redress? Yeah, so with redress, there are some quite complex rules around what happens if a person passes away, and it depends on the time when they pass away. Um, and so um, I won't kind of go into it all now, but, but it's definitely in there in the legislation. So if, for example, they die after the application has been made, but before it's been um, allocated, then there's, there's a particular rule there. And it kind of goes then, if you know it's been allocated, but no decision, then there's a different rule there. So in certain circumstances, yes, it can survive in a redress um, scenario. In others, it doesn't survive. In a common law claim, typically when a person dies, the usual rules of survivorship apply and parts of the claim will survive and parts of the claim won't survive. Um, that said, um, I have, um, I can think of a number of occasions where a person has died um, as part of, um, while, while we've had a common law claim on foot and the institution has been prepared to make payments in accordance with um, either, you know, the grant of probate or letters of administration to the estate um, notwithstanding that kind of strictly speaking from a um, survivorship perspective parts of the claim may not in fact survive but typically that's been where the claim has been quite advanced and we've kind of all really understood the quantum of the claim and it's also been in situations where um, the, the the sort of the the uh, the trauma itself has been a factor at play in the death of a person so for example and you know, many survivors of complex trauma go on to suffer alcohol and other sub substance abuse type issues. And so I've had occasions where those issues, which have in fact been caused by the trauma in the first place, have in fact what's um, materially contributed to the person's death. And then so we've been able to sort of say to the institution, look, you know, um, it, it was the, the trauma that caused this, that caused the death. There's intergenerational components to complex trauma and you know they've paid but as i say that's that's really been the institution doing the right thing as distinct from um, an actual legal obligation because it just falls back to the normal rules around survivorship mm, very interesting and and very complex um but that's all the questions we've got for today. Um, if you do have any other questions out there in the audience and you'd like to email them through, I'm really happy to pass them on to Michelle. And, and uh, as she mentioned earlier, she's happy to address those as well. But for now, thank you so much, Michelle, on behalf of everyone who's joined in today. Great presentation, really interesting and, and um, you know, just very clear demonstration of the the shortfalls in the redress scheme as compared with the recommendations um, that were provided um, so many years ago now. Um, so thanks so much everyone for joining us and thanks um, again to Michelle. Um, if you can stick on the line um, and fill out the very short um, feedback form, we'd muchly appreciate that. Um, it helps us to make sure that these sessions are relevant and um, meet uh, your expectations um, and we'll see you next time at our next webinar later in April. Thanks so much everyone, have a great day.